everybody, it's Emily. Welcome to another Grass River micro class. I'm hanging out off the Chippewa Loop today and I wanted to talk to you guys about ticks today. Um, we are in tick season. Um, I've already had a couple on me uh, this year. So uh, we'll talk about the three kinds of ticks that you might come across in Michigan. We'll talk um, obviously about Lyme disease um, and we will also talk about what to do if you find that you have been bitten by a tick. All right, so let's talk three major kinds of ticks. Number one, more than 80% of ticks that are submitted to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services are this kind of tick. Um, it's the American dog tick. Some people also call it the wood tick, but it's by far the most common kind in Michigan. Um, and these, uh, these pictures I took off of um, a presentation that Dr. Jean Sow gave for us at Grass River about a year ago um, on ticks. Uh, so you'll see the four um, different uh, life stages, sort of. So the top left, that's the adult male. Now the adult male of pretty much every species of tick, at least every species of tick in Michigan, um, doesn't really blood feed in the way that the other life stages do. They might sip occasionally, but they won't latch on for days um, and you're very unlikely to have them on you. So you don't have to pay as much attention to what the adult male looks like. The adult female, you'll see a lot. Um, so that, uh, notice like the, it's sort of brown colored and it's sort of mottled um, with white. That's the um, adult female. And then the nymph you'll notice is much smaller, still with a little bit of modeling. And then the larva is even smaller, very tiny. Um, so that's the most common one. So pay attention to that. Um, and also I should say that they uh, do have the ability to, um, transmit some pathogens like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Tularemia, but they're very, very rare. Um, so you really don't have to worry too much when you get bit by a dog tick, which again, is by far the most common kind we have here. Number two, the one that people really worry about, uh, this is the black-legged tick, also called a deer tick. Um, and it's smaller than the dog tick, um, and it looks different, it's different color. So the adult female, um, notice that she's sort of reddish colored and then her shield that part on her back that doesn't go all the way down is black um, and she'll be about half the size of an American dog tick female um, and then the nymph and the larva you mostly never see just because they are so small like the size of a poppy seed for the nymph and even smaller for the larva uh, so really key into that what that adult female looks like these guys of course um, are the ones that carry Lyme disease or the bacteria that causes Lyme disease I should say the bacteria is called Borrelia burgdorferi uh, But people usually just refer to it as the Borrelia bacteria or the Lyme disease pathogen um, And then the third kind super 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 rare uh, to find in Michigan That is the Lone Star Tick called the Lone Star Tick because you'll see the adult female has that one white dot on her shield. Um, there is no established, established population of these outside of a very isolated area in southwestern Michigan in Grand Mere State Park, which is right around the Benton Harbor area. Um, at, least in, at least in Michigan, there's no established population of them outside of there. You might occasionally, like if, like it's super, super rare, but occasionally they might be seen um, elsewhere in the state, but it's because they usually feed on birds. And then when the birds migrate, like in the spring, um, then the ticks can drop off of them in a random location. But they don't, there's no established population of them outside that small area of Southwest Michigan. Um, and these guys can, um, transmit some of the same pathogens that dog ticks do, like that Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Tularemia and a couple different things, um, but they don't transmit the Lyme disease pathogen. That is just black-legged ticks. So just a couple more notes about the different forms that these ticks can take. Um, the reason that the male's shield goes all the way down its back and the female stops sort of halfway um, is to allow uh, the female to really swell uh, when she's getting that blood meal. Um, if you've ever seen an engorged tick, you know that their appearance changes a lot and they get sort of like gray with old blood um, and they really swell up. So that's allowed, allowing her to stretch the male because he doesn't really uh, take in all that much blood. He'll just sip mostly for hydration purposes. Um, 
he doesn't really need to be able to swell so much. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that if you're wondering how uh, the tick gets from the larval stage to the nymphal stage to the adult stage, that all has to do with its feeding schedule. So obviously uh, they're, they're laid as eggs in the beginning. Uh, they hatch into larva and then the larva has to go um, in search of a meal. Uh, and so if they are successful in feeding, um, the larvae usually feed for like three to four days, um, then uh, they drop off and then they'll molt into a nymph um, with that sort of energy that they got from um, the blood meal. And then um, the nymph will go looking for another blood meal. It'll feed if it finds a, a suitable host for four to six days. Uh, and then it'll drop off and it will molt into an adult. Um, and then the adult will feed, uh, again, just the female, right? Because she's getting energy for um, laying those eggs and mating. The adult male doesn't care about feeding, just wants to find a female to mate. So that's sort of how that works. Um, and the adults will feed for um, longer because they're larger, need more energy. Um, so somewhere like eight to 12 days if you let them stay on you. Okay, so we can't have a micro class about ticks without talking about Lyme disease. So again, this is um, uh, a disease that is caused by our immune system's reaction to the Borrelia bacteria that can be transmitted to us if we get bit by a black-legged tick. Um, not always, it just is if the tick is infected and if the tick is um, attached to you for usually longer than um, 36 hours, it has to be in order to actually transmit um, that bacteria to you. Uh, both nymphal ticks and adult black-legged ticks can transmit the bacteria. Um, interestingly, it's um, the nymphal ticks are responsible for the vast majority of cases of Lyme disease. Um, and that's because the nymphal ticks, like we talked about earlier, are just so tiny that you're sort of unlikely to find them if they do bite you. Um, the adult female deer ticks, you're likely to find them um, relatively soon. Um, I had two on me earlier this spring and I, they weren't engorged at all yet when I pulled them off. So I think they were only on there for, you know, a couple hours. So you're more likely to find them um, and they're less likely to transmit the bacteria. Um, okay, I do like to clear up a common misconception that people have about uh, Lyme disease and the Borrelia bacteria. Ticks are not born with um, this bacteria. There's no vertical transmission. Like if the mother is infected, that does not mean that her offspring are going to be infected. Um, so ticks, black-legged ticks hatch and live there in their larval stage. Um, whoop, deer fly. Um, live in their larval stage uh, totally uninfected. And they only pick up the bacteria when they do their first blood meal. Um, and that is because uh, that Borrelia bacteria uh, is maintained in the ecosystem um, by certain species of animals that are hosts for black-legged ticks that um, we term reservoirs. So they are animals that they won't die from the bacteria. Often it doesn't really affect them much if they're infected with it, but they also won't clear it from their system. So they're sort of maintaining the bacteria in, um, in the, on the landscape and uh, some of those uh, reservoir species that um, black-legged ticks often pick up the Lyme disease bacteria from are especially white-footed mice. White-footed mice are a big one. Um, but then some other uh, animals like chipmunks and shrews and robins. Um, there are some animals like rabbits and white-throated sparrows uh, that can maintain um, the, the bacteria for a short period of time in their systems, but eventually they will clear it so they can sort of be secondary reservoirs. Um, a lot of the animals that we sort of associate with Lyme disease, like deer, uh, they actually often, if, a, if an infected tick latches onto them and feeds, um, the deer actually often clears the tick of being infected. Um, the deer, white-tailed deer do not act as a reservoir uh, for the Borrelia bacteria, neither do raccoons or squirrels. Um, so some animals are really good at maintaining it, some aren't. So the ticks, the larval, oh man, sorry, lots of books. Uh, the larval ticks will feed on, if they feed on an infected animal, they will then become infected themselves. And then after they molt into a nymph, then they're still infected. And when they go to have their second blood meal, if it's on a human, say, um, then they can infect that human. 
Um, so that's how that sort of works. And I should say that um, you're probably aware that Lyme disease uh, has sort of been increasing um, in uh, prevalence in Michigan. Uh, it especially seems to be um, sort of crawling up the coastline of Lake Michigan, so along the western part of the state. Um, and that's probably due to a change in climate. Um, and we know that the climate is more mild near the lakeshore. Um, and so that tick is able to sort of move northward. Um, so not just the, the black-legged tick is moving northward, um, but the Lyme disease pathogen is as well. And there's actually some interesting research that I'm actually really excited about um, that uh, a couple different um, people are working on. Jean Sow, who I mentioned earlier um, at Michigan State, but then also um, a professor who we were able to meet um, last summer at Grass River. She came up. Um, her name is Dr. Susan Hoffman out of Miami of Ohio. Um, and she is looking at how uh, a changing climate um, is allowing uh, white-footed mice to start um, increasing their range northward. Um, and as we know, they are one of the major reservoirs. They are probably the major reservoir for the Borrelia bacteria. Um, so the fact that they are increasing their range northward, um, increasingly out-competing deer mice, which used to be the dominant um, mouse in these woods, um, that probably has a lot to do with the fact, um, with why Lyme disease is um, encroaching northward. There is some good news though, at least for now, I guess depending on where you're living in northern Michigan. Um, so I mentioned that we were able to meet um, Dr. Susan Hoffman last summer. Uh, she came up here, there's a mosquito that's flying around the lens, sorry if you can see that. Um, <laughs> she came up here last summer to do um, some trapping of small mammals, um, especially mice, so looking for those white-footed mice. Um, and this was part of sort of a transect, a big transect that she was running from um, Manistee Benzie area, so near the coast, um, up sort of northeastwards um, to near Gaylord. Um, and we sort of fell on that transect and she was looking at the incidence of um, infection uh, with the Borrelia bacteria of white-footed mice and other small mammals along that transect. And what she found is that none of the 15 mice that she trapped here at Grass River uh, were infected with that bacteria, uh, meaning that they're not serving as a reservoir for the Lyme disease bacteria here at Grass River. But uh, the mice closer to the lakeshore in like the Benzie County area were heavily infected. Um, so this is just a caution that if you, the closer you live to the lakeshore, um, the more cautious you should be about um, making sure that you're taking tick bite prevention measures um, and checking yourself uh, for ticks when you get home. Um, speaking of tick bite prevention measures, let's talk about what you can do. Um, a lot of great bug sprays work. Like I like um, something called Picaridin. Um, it's an active ingredient in a lot of different types of bug sprays that repels not only mosquitoes, um, but also ticks. Uh, if you're really concerned about it, you can use something called permethrin to pre-treat your clothing with. Um, you can't spray it right on your skin, it's toxic in that way, um, but you can uh, pre-treat your clothing with it and it's good for about six washes. Um, but honestly, I think, and well, then there's also like the behavioral uh, prevention measures like tucking your pants into your socks and wearing light colored clothing so that you can more easily see ticks if they're on you. But Honestly, I think the best measure for preventing bites um, and for preventing disease uh, is just do tick checks when you get home from being in the woods. Um, especially pay attention to areas that might be moist or warm, which is where ticks like to be. So like uh, your armpits, your groin, uh, behind the backs of your knees, um, in your scalp or behind your ears. Um, so look for, look in those places. Uh, if you do find a tick, first of all, don't panic at all because like we said, the vast majority of ticks that we find up here are dog ticks and it is highly unlikely that you would get any pathogens from them. Um, but even if it is a deer tick and you're able to identify it as a deer tick, don't panic um, because not every tick um, is, not every black legged tick is infected with that Borrelia bacteria. Um, and depending on where you are in Michigan, the vast majority of them are not. Um, and even if they are infected, they have to feed on you for more than 36 hours in order, in order to be able to even transmit that. And if you do end up getting the bacteria from them and you catch it soon enough, and we'll talk about what to look for, um, it's 
treated easily with antibiotics. Um, so you only really, really have to worry when it sort of sets up shop and you don't treat it uh, right away with antibiotics. Um, so if you do get bit by a deer tick, um, pull, pull it off just like you would with any other tick. Tweezers really close to the skin and just pull straight up very steadily. Don't jerk. Um, don't hold a match to the tick. Um, I, I think I've seen, uh, you know, some people uh, write that in blog posts or some people say that, that it can help um, encourage, encourage the tick to back out and not let, uh, let go of its release on you. Um, but can it actually cause the tick to burrow in further? Um, so we don't want to do that. So just take the tweezers and pull it out. Save your tick um, because if you do end up having any symptoms, um, that lets healthcare providers be able to test your tick for um, any uh, pathogens that it might be carrying. Uh, so good way to do is just like tape it on a note card um, and write the date uh, and that you pulled it off and where you pulled it off from, or you can put it in a Ziploc bag in your freezer. Um, and then if you want it to be identified, um, you can send it into the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Um, or what's really cool is Dr. Jean Sow with some of her colleagues from a couple different universities put together this awesome app called the Tick app. Um, and you do have to go in and make an account, but it's very simple. Um, and you can actually upload photos of a tick if you found one or if you pulled one off of you and you can get an expert ID uh, within a couple days. And there's also a lot of really great other information on there just about tick bite prevention and what to do um, if, uh, if you do get a tick bite. And also um, based on your location, uh, the incidence of um, tick activity in your area and what um, life stage is most likely to be out at that time of year in your location. Okay, so hopefully uh, this gave you guys, I know it's a lot of information, but hopefully um, cleared up a couple misconceptions and gave you guys um, some good, uh, some good information. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, again, the Tick app is a really great resource, uh, but so is the CDC and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Um, all right, I'll see you guys soon. Thanks, bye.